Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, my name is Karen. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is September 6, 1989. My home group is Tuaco, Tuaco, New Jersey. If you don't know where that is, you have to find us. But it's part of Montville Township. I have been there since I got sober. I got sober in the dungeon. Uh, it's been an amazing group experience for me, being part of anything, <laughs> making a commitment to do that. Very important to me. Um, I have a sponsor. Her name is Michael Earl. She is one of the presenters coming up for the weekend. Um, and my sponsor is a sponsor. I sponsor women. I take commitments. I do the deal. Stay in the middle of the wagon. I was told that I might not get drunk. And so I have followed that advice all this time. And uh, I'm going to share some experience. But before I do that, I'd like to qualify a little bit. You know, we've been listening to uh, all these wonderful experience, strength, and hope stories as we get to step 11. And I was thinking about it last week when Ron was talking about 10, and I have a hard time talking about 11 without backing up a little bit and talking about step 10 and how how you get to that place for me. Okay, so a little bit about me. I, I was born in Chicago. I have a twin brother. We're the oldest of seven kids. I also have six stepbrothers and a stepsister. My family uh, moved around a lot. I understand today it's it's about geographic relocation. (laughs) I learned that word in AA, (laughs) that uh, my dad is an alcoholic. He is now sober 34 years. My mom died from this disease. Um, In uh, the 50s, my dad's uncle was part of the founding group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Chicago, and they brought him a big book, and he kindly told him where he thought he ought to put that book. And I just cannot imagine what our life would have been like had he found Alcoholics Anonymous then, as opposed to now. I just sometimes think, whoa, I wonder what happened with our life. So be it as it may, that wasn't our story to tell. And uh, I grew up in a lot of craziness and a lot of addictions. And the stories are endless, and they're, uh, you all can probably identify with them. They uh, are crazy. I woke up in places I shouldn't be with people I shouldn't be with. I was doing things that I never would have done had I not been drinking and, and using um, blood altering substances not allowed to be called here. Um, and it wouldn't happen, but it did. And, uh, you know, I found that being the oldest of these kids, I had a lot of responsibility, you know, taking care of them because my parents were MIA a lot. And, uh, you know, we were, we moved around a lot and we didn't move around like you get the U-Haul or you get the Allied truck and and moves to the next town. It was like in the middle of the night scatter. And that's kind of like how we did that. And we, I went to five different grammar schools and four different high schools. So, you know, I, I wasn't rooted anywhere. And when I say I have a home group and I've been there for 22 years, it's real important. I mean, I'm rooted someplace and I found those roots here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I found my family here. I found an opportunity to be who I am, and you guys love me through it, even if it needed required change, you know? So, um, because I believed you. There's absolutely nothing more powerful than one of us talking to another, because I believe you. You haven't steered me wrong yet. So the story goes on, as many of our stories go, into a whole lot of crazy ideas, and one of the... um, Things that I learned how to do was to be whoever you wanted me to be. If you wanted me to do that, I would do that. Because if I did that, you wouldn't yell at me. There was no um, opportunity to um, have any physical violence involved. Uh, I I would be pleasing you. You know, so that's kind of like what I knew. Um, Also being born into this Irish Catholic crazy family, you know, they partied a lot. And alcohol was always part of our life. So I really didn't know any difference from happy, glad, sad, mad. It was always there, always available. We were never stopped from drinking. You know, it was always like join the party. But most of the time the parties didn't end up well. (laughs) You know, and uh, I, I learned that I hated when they drank. I loved them when they didn't, which is kind of like how we are. Oh, man, the alcoholic is so lovable. 
So as time went on, you know, all I wanted to do was flee from that family. And uh, my dad took a transfer out here to New Jersey, and it was my junior year in high school, and uh, to Mountain Lakes. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Mountain Lakes, New Jersey, but I'm a Midwest kid, had gone to Catholic schools. All I wore was uniforms, so I had no wardrobe. We didn't have much money, and um, Mountain Lakes is a very affluent town. And uh, I just begged my parents, don't send me to a Catholic school. I want to be normal. <laughs> and uh, so there I was in this school with an Irish, you know, Midwestern twang that I really do try to cover up so you can't identify where I come from. And uh, I, I found the people there. Then I found the drugs, and I found the alcohol, and I found the escape, because every minute of every day was a hole in my soul, and I couldn't, couldn't figure out why I felt this way. And the more I drank, the more the hole grew, the more I found other activities to fill the hole, you know, the deal, and uh, until I found Mr. Wonderful, and... Uh, you know, we took off, and I married a guy and proceeded to absolutely stuff the life out of him because all I knew how to do was take hostages, you know. And uh, so there in law, I was told a story about what we had in common other than lust was totally just drinking and drugging and dealing, and we didn't have any communication dealing. I would never have been able to stand in front of you and tell you how I feel, where I went, what I did, what kind of person I had become, you know, uh, before Alcoholics Anonymous, because you accept me as exactly who I am, where I'm at, and uh, I learned that here. So long story short, driven to um, a place, that jumping off place our book refers to, where I I didn't want to live, but I didn't want to die. And I had everything in front of me, and my ex, he had the kids that night, and it was a Labor Day weekend, and I was alone, and I was so lonely, you know, in a vision for you, those four horsemen were jumping all over my table, and uh, you know what? God spoke. I heard him. I uh, called Alcoholics Anonymous. Actually, I called St. Clair's. And they suggested I might want to check myself into detox. And I told them what I thought of that idea. And, uh, you know, we're not very pleasant when we're drunk. And I, but I was real curious about what she said, so I drove to see her. I drove to see this woman who told me about Alcoholics Anonymous because, frankly, I really didn't know much about that. The preceding nine months, my husband had walked out, couldn't imagine why he left such a wonderful person like me. You know, and and I still had a house, and I had my kids, and I had the dog, and I had everything there, and uh, um, I couldn't figure out why, 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 you know. And um, she gave me a meeting book. This nice woman at St. Clair's Rehab handed me a meeting book, and uh, the next night I walked into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was in Denville, New Jersey. It was at Union Hill. There was a greeter at the door, and this is so, so important to me. And this guy held my hand and welcomed me someplace. And i got to tell you, for a drunk like me, no one had welcomed me anywhere for an awfully long time. And for the first time, I walked in that room, and, and I know why they say to people who go in and out and relapse, keep coming back, because you get to, you get to walk back into the magic. You get to walk back into a power that is beyond our understanding when you walk into a room of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I got to walk into that, and I, um, I spot the coffee pot, and I am shaking, and I am scared, and I don't understand much anything, and you guys talk in a language that is like, all in, you know, it's like my insurance business because I'm in I'm an insurance, and all we do is have acronyms for everything, so, so do you. And I was like, oh, this is really confusing. And uh, I walk over the coffee pot, and there was Kathleen. And uh, she said, hey, would you like a cup of coffee? She said, just sit down. And uh, she's been my friend ever since. And uh, the obsession for me was lifted immediately. The desire to flee wasn't lifted. In fact, on my 90-day sobriety, my friends made me a T-shirt. It said 80 West, because that's all I like to do is flee the situation. 
you know, it was big orange t-shirt, it said 80 West, and uh, I would get so frustrated with what was going on, because remember, I wore a mask, and you're suddenly telling me, don't do that, you know, stay in the moment, face your fears, and I'm going, ah, I can't do that, I didn't want to drink, and I didn't want to drug, and I really, there was something in that room with that guy's handshake that I just wanted, no idea how to get it, and um, I would get in my car, and I'd drive to the Delaware Water Gap, calm down enough, and go home, you know, and... um That went on for quite a while. That went on for close to seven months before I could, okay, stay in my skin a little bit and not go into a full-fledged panic attack that there might be a solution for me. You know, Chris talked about it on the first night he was here, and he said you have to be separated from alcohol long enough to know that there is a solution for you. You have to step away to have the idea that you might be able to have this too. You know, I I believe in my heart and soul. You know, we have the grace. We have the spirituality. We're just separated. And we're, we're, we're separated from that power greater than ourselves. And we don't even know that's what it is. Because alcohol was my power. And it was my solution. So little by slowly, and I, I'll talk more about my recovery because I want to get into a little bit about the magic of Step 11. Um, little by slowly, I started to believe that, hey, you know what, this might work for me. I didn't talk much when I came here. Um, It took me three years to actually have a phone list of some network people. You might find that hard to believe today, but that's what my story is. And I heard at the convention this weekend, the Al-Anon speaker said, I pray you have a slow and painful recovery. And I had that. Had it not been so, I don't think I'd be in the glory of sobriety like I am because what I have today is a pure gift, and I am so grateful for it. So I met this woman, and her name was Karen, and she was soon to become my first sponsor, and um, I'm checking things out. You know, the 90-day thing's coming, and I don't have anybody, and I really don't know if I can do that, ask somebody to help me. And uh, so I asked her to be my sponsor because people told me that she's got so many pigeons that she will say no, and she said yes. And uh, she's a big book woman, big book thumper. Uh, I I learned that term. She's a step Nazi. She's a service queen. And she was just what I needed to get myself in the middle of the wagon. I I am a typical alcoholic, undisciplined, selfish and self-centered. I am described in the book, and I definitely had no intention of being the dot in the middle, and she brought me to being the dot in the middle and being grateful for that. And that is a miracle. It is simply a miracle. So um, this past summer, I have spent uh, time trying to find my old sponsorship line just to meet them and tell them how grateful I am for the gifts that they gave me. And I was just out in Pittsburgh, and that's where uh, Karen is now. Most of them moved to sponsor land, also known as Florida. <laughs> she moved to Pittsburgh. And, um, and I went out there, and I was part of a, a conference in, in Pittsburgh. What an honor and a privilege to be part of anything. Because I, 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 I clearly remember what that was like not being a part of anything. And I didn't even know it was my choice. I didn't know that that unmanageability in my life caused by my drinking had anything to do with that. And little by little, Karen showed me this. You know, she promised me when she did that qualification in her living room in her chair that I call the rocket ship, I asked her if she'd leave it to me in her will, (laughs) if I could have her rocket ship. And she sat there and she qualified me and why did I think I was an alcoholic and the obsession of the mind. I mean, she really did. And she taught me about doing those very same things for the women who were to come into my life, which I didn't believe also would be possible for me. And she did that. And um, she sat there and tears streaming down her face. It was the first person. And it was that one-on-one that we read about with Bill and Bob and the rest of us. It was that one-on-one that she heard me. She heard me. And she knew what I was talking about. And she kept saying, yes, there's a solution for you. And she didn't say it like that. But what she said was this, if you just do what we do, you will not believe the woman you'll become. 
All I wanted to be was the best I could be. Alcohol was in the way. Alcohol was my solution. There's no way I could be the best I could be. I didn't even have an inkling of what that was. So little by little, I learned how to do things, important things like making lunch for my kids sober. That was really important. I, like, I became stupid when I gave up drinking. I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't function. And it took a while before like my mind cleared and I was able to, you know, I'd look at the um, collection of cups. You know how I used to have beautiful glasses and they eventually would move into the collection of cups? Yeah. So for your drink of choice, and I ended up, my final drink of choice was wine, and it was just because, um, you know, hey, it gets me to where I want to go fast. So, you know, it's like rocket juice, and it, it was poured into a great big... I only had one, but, you know, you know what they look like. Yeah, so she told me how to get rid of all those, and, and we walked through my home, and, and she told me stuff like, my kids didn't ask to be born. I have a responsibility to take care of them. He left too bad. Get a grip. And that's how she worked with me, and I was like, well, doesn't she understand? And she was like, yeah, she understood, but she put every solution she told me, is in the book. Every solution, every question you might have, you'll find the solution in the book. And she taught me about the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous as a love story between a God, as I understand him, as I understand him, and me. That it gave me, and all of us, but me the directions to get on with my life and in my daily living in a way that I never dreamed possible for me if I just followed the directions. And she'd always change it. It's not a suggestion, Karen. It's a direction. It's not a suggestion. You know, and she put me back and forth. And she taught me the work. She taught me how to do the steps out of the step book in relation to the big book. Like we do the big book reading and a step book reading and then she'd add in other things like uh, as Bill sees it or she'd, she'd add in another piece of literature and she taught me the literature. In the front of our book it gives you a list. Please read the list. There's a list of literature, suggested reading. And this woman loved me back till I could love me. And then about seven months sober I called her up and it was two in the morning and uh, I'm cleaning the grout in my bathroom with a toothbrush because all that needed to be cleaned, you know. And uh, I was totally ridiculous about, you know, clothes had to be color-coded because if my order on the outside was clean and neat, then maybe the order on the inside would stop being so hard. Of course, that is not what works. And she said to me, she started to read, Have you ceased fighting everything and everyone? Sanity, we were, she was reading me the 10th step promises. And she said, are you done yet? And I was done, and I was only then able to hear the message of Alcoholics Anonymous and to put myself into the work and into her hands to teach me because clearly I did not have the answer because if I did, I would have done it. And where the answers were found, they were not only found in the study of the book, but they were truly found in working with others. They were truly found in the service side of Alcoholics Anonymous and in just doing what I was told to do. When she said to me, you need to be a greeter, I almost freaked out. I didn't want to touch anyone's hand. You know, it was like, oh, my God. And she would, you hug like an ironing board. That must change. (laughs) You know, she took me on 12-step calls. You know, and it was like, oh, did you call AA? I mean, I was felt so inadequate with regard to my recovery process. And the rest of my life, you know, I, I thought I was smart. You know, I could deal with my job. Fine. But with regard to me, forget about it. No dealage whatsoever. I love the way Chris words that. No dealage whatsoever. So little by slowly, we walk through the work. And something happened to me in the process of understanding steps six and seven and understanding that I could take a character defect or a defense behavior and I could turn around and I could give it to God and I could say, oh, God, please help me with this gossip. You know, I recognize that I'm gossiping and criticizing. Please help me with this and help me to be compassionate. And help me to understand in the seven-step prayer, I'm allowed to ask for that. Give me the strength 
to see that I'm good enough exactly as I am. And she taught me these things, and she, found, and she showed me the prayers in the big book, and she showed me how to relate them to my life and how to be interactive with my recovery. And uh, we would go meeting busting. We'd pick a meeting out of the book we never went to, and we'd go meeting busting. And she showed me that there was a life outside of this little corner that I had stuck myself in. She showed me that I didn't need to be afraid. And as we would travel around to these different meetings, I started to meet friends, and you know, we'd go on retreats, and we would go on conferences, which is like this past weekend with the New Jersey conference. And uh, the first New Jersey conference, I was three weeks sober, and there was a big room. Um, you know, they split up the big banquet room, and they had little breakout rooms. And across the one, it said microwave recovery, and I went, "Oh, I'm in." <laughs> and I walk in, and it was a big book panel. <laughs> You know, by my mind, that's what I needed, fast and quick. You know, uh, I have a hobby. It's quilting, and, um, you know, I had to get a hobby. My sponsor said, you have to get a hobby, and I don't care if it's freaking collecting rocks. I had to do something with this energy. And so I started quilting, and now I'm a fabricolic. I don't know. I collect fabric. But one of the things that it did is that they have this thing, this project, and they get it sign up for all the time. It's called the Mystery Quilt, Quilt to Quilt in the Night. I'm going, oh, I'm there. <laughs> you know, that's how we are. We want instant results. I mean, that will not change from my personality. It just won't change. So as we walk forward in the process, and uh, we got involved in this harm's done, and on steps eight and nine, um, I, I, I looked at this discovery of my past, and it was like, oh. God, look what I have done. And thank God for sponsorship that said, that was the past and today is today. You never have to be that person again. You never have to be that person again. And uh, the program and the steps are loving. They, they bring you to freedom. They don't, are not here to criticize you or cut you down. They bring you to being free. So how free do you want to be? Get out of the outcome. Stay in the present. You know, she taught me about the slogans that I thought were oh so dumb. Oh so dumb. Easy does it. Not part of my lifestyle, you know. Slow down. But for the grace of God, I like that one. I could hang on to that one. I understand God's grace. I understand it the night that I had an inkling that alcohol is my problem and God lifted the obsession to drink. As well, in step six, it outlines for us that he can do the same thing with everything else if we just let them Ah, if we just let them so we move on into this and this step eight and nine process was absolutely mind-blowing for me to write a list of all the people I had harmed and become willing and she had me write a story and and I worked really closely with my sponsor and if you haven't done that you need to do that because I was hanging on to things that were none of my business that were oh so important and very much ignoring things that I needed to address because that's how my brain works. It continues to work that way. I need guidance. I learn in step five. I may not supervise myself. If I supervise myself, I will, you all are in trouble. For the most part. And I'm better today at doing the next right thing than I was back then. But um, I still need guidance because I love the edge. i got to tell you that I love a challenge and love the edge. And I'm the first one. Hey, why don't we try this? I get the eye rolled eyes like, what are we doing? I'm like, I don't know. It sounds good. It can get you in a lot of trouble. You know, and for the most part, prayer and meditation, the steps we're going to talk about tonight, have given me the guidance to make correct decision with the right motive and to slow it down enough to pass it by up, you know, to my sponsorship line and then bring it back down. So I, I've learned some technique to do that. Because I, as a recovering alcoholic, still have behaviors and attitudes that can, I can go off like a jet in a second. So I need to be pulled back. And I accept that today because I know who I am. So we're doing this eight-step process, eight and nine, and, and uh, magic started to happen with that. I started to be able to see exactly the wrong I had done and what I needed to do. And no matter what, what every single man I did with the guidance of my sponsor, no matter what it was and what needed to be said, and how could I make this right, and is there anything I left out, I had an unbelievable, phenomenal experience of total freedom. And I also let those people free. 
You know, she did give me the, the privilege to write a column in there that says never on this planet in my lifetime list, and I did that. And those people eventually did move over into I am ready to make amends to them. And to my knowledge, I don't have anyone on there today, but you know about that old onion. <laughs> they do pop up. But we have a process to take care of them, an unbelievable process of forgiveness of, of self and others. And probably it's the only place that she said, here you may look at yourself, you know, and in terms of forgiveness. Have you forgiven yourself for the wrongs you have done others? You know, some of them were hard, but they all went well, and uh, they all went well. They all went well. And uh, it took a while, but the freedom starts to come. And they aren't kidding when they say that. The freedom came. And in this freedom... I started to like feel really good about who I am. And uh, exactly what Karen had told me years before that would happen when I went through the process. So then we got into steps 10 and 11. And 10 and 11 were wonderful because in step 10 I learned about that. I could start my day over any minute. I just had one of those the other day, and I must have started my day over 15 times before I got to noon. And uh, my business that I'm in is really hard right now, and people are very abrupt, and I was tired, so I wasn't taking that too well, you know, people's abruptness. So I stopped my day, and I was able to start it over and complete it. You know, I can look at that. I can look and stop and start. So that is awesome (laughs) that we can start our day over and just for today. But more importantly, at the end of Step 10, and Ron's... Ron uh, talked about a little bit. We must carry the vision of God's will for us into our entire life. What the heck is that? I know when I read that, I was like, I do not want to be a saint. I want to be a saint. How can I be a saint? I don't want to be like that. People don't like saints, you know, and that's all I saw. I didn't see that what it was, was it was the good in me, that I needed to carry the good and, you know, one short, take a, oh, out, you got God. But if you take one short, it's God. The good in me, God's will. So instead of gossiping, you be quiet. Instead of criticizing, I look, what am I uh, reacting to? You know, you start to look for the motive under the motive. Thy will not mine be done. And uh, you receive strength and direction and help from him, from my God as I understand him. And you really need to know what that is for you. If you're going to seek it, you know, I've learned to take it, what is bugging me through that process and come up with incredible information, like a wisdom information. I never would have thought of that because the God of my understanding brings me to a place that I never understood before. He brings me to an understanding that I never had before. And I can tell you the exact moment in my recovery process where this became important. I was seeing a therapist, and I had been seeing her for quite a while, and she moved to France. If she was still here, I'd probably still be seeing her. She was phenomenal for me. I could tell her anything, very much like my sponsor. She was an ACOA that is part of my story. You know, um... I come from a ton of abuse, so I had a really hard time not blaming others for how I turned out, you know. So she really helped me with that bridge. She really helped me with the bridge of me, uh, as I say about her. One day I was complaining, as only we can complain. After all, I pay you so I can complain to you uh, about my life and about the situation I had with my ex, who I was going in and out of this abusive relationship with. And... um, I had gotten myself to the place where I had uh, been in the battered woman's shelter. And uh, I was talking to her, and she said to me very clearly, Care, do you believe there's a plan for you? Do you believe that there's a God of your understanding who has a plan for you in this lifetime? I said, yeah. Yeah, I'll go with that. Yeah, I believe that. He said, okay, picture this. Close your eyes and just picture this. You and God are hanging out before you're born. And he says to you, what do you think you need to work on in this lifetime? Now, I knew the answer to that. We had uncovered it in my fifth step. We had uncovered the motive under the motive. And like many of you, I felt worthless. I felt of no value. 
I felt I didn't have anything to contribute because my actions of my addiction determined who I am. Not the grace of God who determines every single one of us, but those are the actions. So I'm like, okay. I said, okay, as worthiness. And she said, all right. So you and God, and God says to me, Karen, everything in this lifetime, no matter what it is in this lifetime, I will make sure that you will know that you are worthy. I will bring you every person, every place, every situation to experience and know that you are worthy. So I'm born in the family I'm born into. I'm hit with the challenges of the lifestyle I had. I marry the guy because I'm ignoring God's good. I picked up the tool of addiction. That was my solution. I had a problem with God, love God, no problem. We didn't have a relationship. That was as simple as that. So I, I say, and then she says to me, and then you die and you go to heaven and there they are all lined up, all those people of challenge in your life. And who heads the line but your ex? And he says to you, you know, Kara, I promise to help God. It gave me a whole new perspective on simply this, that I have a choice in every situation. I have a choice to love. I have a choice to hate. I have a choice to accept or I have a choice to walk away. It's all in my choice. That is the only control I have. So 10 and 11 have become very important because I don't necessarily know what that is. So in my 11-step practice, it says in our book, Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. We shouldn't be shy on this matter of prayer. I don't have a problem with prayer. I like some of the prayers that you read that are in books, and you know, I like those prayers a lot. They go to my soul. I'm from all of that. So that is really awesome. But in our literature, there's a whole bunch of them. Here's one, and it says, You have to understand, when I'm at step 11, I'm not necessarily trusting that God is going to bring me to it. The step says that I sought through prayer and meditation. The book says we, but if I personalize my program, I say I sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God that I understand, praying only for his will for me and the power to carry it out, and the power to carry it out, the power to carry it out. How do I do that? I don't know how to do that. I don't have access to that solution yet. So uh, in our book, on page 87 and 88, it says, as we go through our day, we pause when agitated or doubtful, and we ask for the right action or thought. We ask God for the right action or thought. We constantly remind ourselves that we're no longer running the show. Going right back to that. Humbly saying to ourselves many times, thy will be done, not mine. You know, God, I'm agitated and doubtful. Go back to the 10th step prayer. I'm agitated and I'm doubtful. Help me. Help me. Remember. Bring me to who I am to be. At the end of the 10th step, it says that uh, we have a daily reprieve. And something about that word reprieve has really caught me up. And a reprieve in the 1935 dictionary means suspension of a death sentence. So if you look at that word and you look at the opportunity we have to pray and meditate daily, if you acknowledge how sick you really are, this practice is phenomenal for people like you and me. So I had to develop a daily practice. I had to set aside time every day. And it's not saying two hours, five hours, ten hours. It's whatever works for you. Once again, it's how it works in your life. You know, we're having an experience with the steps. My experience isn't going to be yours, and yours isn't going to be mine. In fact, yours might make me drink, and I might make you drink. I might get the idea that that's a better solution. So that's why you develop your own. So give me the right thoughts and actions. And uh, not too long ago, I had an incredible experience like this. That ex of mine, IRS issues brought me to a place where um, I had an envelope in my mailbox and I had prayed to God just shortly thereafter, you know what? I was in a lot of debt when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of debt, like close to probably half a million dollars of debt. And um, 21 years, it was all paid. 
It took 21 years to pay the financial amends that I had to take care of. One day at a time. That's all I can tell you is one day at a time. And I reached that place and I said, all right, God, you got it. If there anything that I didn't do, is there anything left out there that needs to be attended to? The next day, only as God can work, an envelope arrived in my mailbox. And uh, he had done something I was unaware of, and the IRS had put a lien on my house. On my house that I own by myself. And I went into this absolute hysteria. And I'm marching around, and I couldn't get a hold of anybody, and I don't know what to do. And I said, oh, the only thing I know to do is go to a meeting. So I pulled out the meeting book, and I'm like, God, you've got to lead me to some solution because I am absolutely going to shred him. I didn't ask God immediately to remove the fear. I didn't share it with another person immediately. I didn't do the directions well, but I did go to a meeting. I know to do that. Went to this meeting, never been to this meeting. I walk in the meeting, and it's a big book meeting, topic meeting, and the girl walks in, and I know her, and says, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, God, I'm just going to listen. And she opens up the big book to step in, and she says, starts reading, when agitated or upset. I almost died. I was like, oh, my God, I forgot to do that. And by the end of that meeting, I had calmed down enough to know all God wants me to do is be. And if he'll bring me to it, he'll bring me through it. And I firmly believe that. So because of the practice of the 10th and 11th step, I have a faith that will take me through those situations because I believe there is a solution that I might not see yet. So because I ceased fighting everything and every, everyone. And sanity has returned in my life. I do have those 10-step practice principle, um, promises in my affairs right now. So the problem being distrust has been eliminated. I have to practice in step 11 that I will get the solution somewhere, somehow, some way. But I have to be disciplined to learn how to wait that the answers will emerge. I've learned that step 11 is about every encounter is a holy encounter. That there is nothing that me and God can't do together. Nothing too big or too small. No experience I've had is accidental. Nothing has been accidental. So the prayer that's on step 11 is like, thy will be done. I'm like saying, all right, here you go. I go back to the beginning when all I could do was flee. He doesn't want me to flee. My God wants me to stay in it. It said, you know, the purpose of this book was to help me solve my problem. My problem, according to now, has been solved. It is contingent on my spiritual growth. It's contingent on effectiveness and growing in effectiveness and understanding. It's contingent. And I found that that power to be my higher power, and I found that that's where my problems are solved. Not by me. If I knew, I would do it. I obviously don't know because I'm in it. Right? So this knowledge and this awareness and this opportunity to step back a little bit has changed my life. Has absolutely changed my life. So it gives some directions in the book. When we retire at night, we constructively review our day. Now, if you don't do this, and this isn't a matter of practice, Here's what I was taught. I, put, I, had a, I was told to take a sticky note and put it on the inside of my medicine cabinet and write it. Where were you? Or were you resentful, selfish, dishonest, and afraid today? Were you? If you were, how come? You know, just review it. You can do this very quickly, but be diligent about it. So now I ask myself those questions. Have I kept something myself that I should share? You know, I ask myself, did that happen today? You know, and if so, what was it? What was it? What was it? Because uh, those little things will trip me up along the way. Were we thinking of myself most of the time, or was I being of service to you? I am really busy. (laughs) I was told that that's procrastination in reverse, and I have to learn how to be. And I'm learning. I'm learning, but it isn't easy for me to do this. And in this practice of looking at what I did, I ask God for forgiveness for anything I have done. And then I take it into meditation. Now, I call this my power hour. You can call it whatever you like. That fits me. You know, I used to have a power hour in the evening, and it did not consist of meditation and prayer. 
Only use your imagination. You can probably figure it out. So my power hour now became a meditation and prayer. Sometimes it's music. Sometimes it's reading. And then always set aside by a moment of reflection. If the word meditation scares you, use reflection. Anything. Just set it aside for a moment. Then I think about that. I say, give it to God. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the meditation practice of walking a labyrinth. Walking Labyrinth has really helped me to develop the discipline of meditation. And in the directions of walking a labyrinth, which is like a maze on the floor, so not a maze because there's a way in and a way out, um, the directions are always the same. And they say to you, ask your higher power what it is that's foremost in your mind, the forefront of your mind, to help you with that. Whatever that is, then set it aside. Then your own mantra, mine happens to be breathe God in, breathe fear out. It can be anything you want to put me in a a place of reception. Then I think about that, breathe God in, breathe fear out, because I already gave my intention to God. I don't really know how to handle that. However long it takes, it might take a minute, it might take ten minutes. Depends on my day, depends. And I reach like the center of that practice and I go, hmm, time time to go and what happens when I come out is I take a piece of paper and I just write whatever my thoughts are and uh, I'm in communication with my higher power whenever those thoughts are things have come out of there that I didn't even know was the root underlying reason you know and I can tell you that lots of times I'm hanging into a payoff for staying in a step one unmanageable problem that knock your socks off it's so silly and all I want to do is the next right thing. I would do it if I knew it. So here you go. Here's a place in how I can get it. So in our book, on page 86 and into action, it gives us some steps. At night, review your day. In the morning, upon awakening, that means when you open your eyes. Upon awakening, we consider our plans for the day. And one of the things I say, please, God, divorce me from selfish and self-seeking motives, and especially my attitude. Because my attitude can get just really judgmental. I know that about me. And I've added one more thing to that in the morning. I offer my day of labor to my higher power. You know, um, I offer my day. And uh, I say, God, you know, take my day, my job, whatever I'm supposed to do today. You got it. I drive around a lot. Keeps me safe and sound and protected. I go to bed at night and I go, whoa. I just met the coolest guy or the situation or I help solve a problem or I get to come here. You know, on my way to Pittsburgh last week, I got a phone call from uh, the hotel we were supposed to have the workshop at. And she said, okay, sorry, we're we're flooded out. You'll have to find a new spot. (laughs) I'm like, all right, God, you got this one. I'm busy this weekend. Find us a place. And he does. And he does. I cannot tell you how my life has changed since turning around and saying, I'm not in charge. I realize the the 11-step promise that says, God is doing for me what I cannot do for myself. Every moment of every day, if I let him. And he's just hanging out waiting. No, I've discovered that too. So in thinking about your day, you may face indecision. Take it to someone. Just say, hey, you know what? I don't know what to do with this. My network is big, is strong, is stable. If I can't get one person, there's another one. If I can't get another one, there's another one. You know, it's really big and stable. Uh, You know, I I know in asking for God for the inspiration, how to handle the next right thing, my days turn out better than I ever expected. I have a life today as a result of this that is not anything I would have written. I have a great imagination. Colorful, they say. We have colorful, vivid imaginations. In uh, Vision for You, it tells us that we have a host of friends. You'll have a host of friends of every place you go. It's very unusual for me to walk someplace into a meeting in our area and not know someone. I think it's so awesome. It's just incredible to me that God has graced us with an opportunity to be of service to you. And that's all that's required of us. That's it. But to be of service to you, I have had to have cleaned my house. I have had to be pure in my attitude towards you. Because an alcoholic will see it. They know when you're off. 
They know when you're not telling the whole truth, nothing but the truth. They know when you're scamming. They know it. There's like you don't get away with any of that here. So we're asked to be of maximum service to God and our fellows. That's it. So how do we do that? This is how we do that. You develop a kind of living that includes a prayer and meditation practice, and you're bulletproof. You literally become bulletproof. Kind of like what I used to feel like when I was a, you know, in my early 20s. I felt bulletproof. Nothing could touch me. I feel that way today. I feel that step 11 has given me being bulletproof. So you can practice this. You can try new things. You can say, okay. And it took me a while to have a consistent, everyday, time aside for me and God desire to do that. Because you've got to practice it. It's about practice. And it's in step 11 for a reason. So you know it's a practice thing. So in this practice, we discovered a couple of things. Just remember this, that any experience you have on any given day, there is no accident. That every encounter is a holy encounter. Mother Teresa said it best. She tries to see the face of God in everyone she meets. Believe me, when you start saying that, you'll be like, I'm trying to see the face of God in this one. (laughs) You really, really, I'm like, I'm really trying. (laughs) You know, and they say there's a lesson in every experience. I don't like that to hear that growing things. There's a lesson in every experience, but... If I don't learn from something I'm objecting to, because I have learned that those objections come from within, that spot it, got it, that something's going on, that if I see something wrong with you or with it, then there's really something not on balance with me and God. Because when there is, you're able to embrace life like you never could, because it simply doesn't matter. Simply doesn't matter. So everyone you meet along your way is destined to be in your journey. Don't think. I mean, I think about this about my ex. And I mean, he, he and I just uh, needed not to live together. Uh, but I have three beautiful children from him. And uh, I have three grandbabies that are so incredible. And I have a relationship with my kids that was really stunted from that very awkward, addictive relationship I had when we were together. And those kids have grown, and I've had um, exactly what Artie B. told me at three weeks over. He said to me, standing outside the convention, he said to me, look it, you will find out that if you just do what we do, that the thread of recovery will run as strong and deep in your life as the alcoholism has. And your relationships will be restored to a place you did not dream possible. I can tell you that it has. At the end of my favorite pamphlet in the whole wide world, it's a member's eye view of Alcoholics Anonymous. Everyone who's in my sponsor line has to read it. I require it because it tells you from a perspective that you just fall right in and it's me doubting you. And at the very end of this pamphlet, it says, even in the longest day of the darkest night, you find in here the miracle that people see and the lame do walk, that they do, that changes and transformations are possible because you witness it. And that's the good news that Alcoholics Anonymous brings to us because we just be of service a day at a time and that's it. So how awesome is that? So I'll leave you with this thought. Be grateful you came here. And just like that woman said at the convention this weekend, I wish you a painful, slow recovery so you get to the place of having this experience that nothing could be more honorable than being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. So with that, I'll close, and I thank you so much for being here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.